after all that. Luke, is it? Yes, sir. I'm Aaron. Hi, Aaron. Nice to see you. Your name is? What's more important than names is branding. Tell me why you'd like to work for this company. What makes you qualified for this position? All questions can be directed to our website. I've taken three personality tests that have all yeah. proven I'd be an excellent worker. And your greatest weakness? My greatest weakness is also my greatest strength. And do you have any goals for the future? Excellence. Customer friendly. Mm -hmm. Grab that by the horns. All hands on deck. Cross platforms. No limits. <laughs> Tell me how you handle stress. Let it fester. If you can keep it hidden, then your life will be better. Let me show you a few no, things. Good. I think we're done. Our work is never done. Okay, now I'll talk. I'll give it a second. <laughs> All right, there it is. There it is. All right, that never gets turned off, but I was like, I wonder, I wonder. Um, you know how many buttons there are in the world? There's too many. The answer is too many. Too many buttons and switches, and they all seem to be tied together with one another. Uh, we got a couple things coming up. Uh, if you are a guest, we would love to know that you are here with us, so fill out. There's a connection card on the seat in the seat back in front of you. We'd love for you to fill that out. Give it to one of our guest service volunteers. They're awesome people, and they would love to give you a gift. So thank you for being here with us today. Uh, you can also do so online. There's a place you can fill that out. Brandon and Noel have got that for you. They're probably saying hi to you, and, and, and hopefully you guys get to know one another online as well. We're one church in multiple locations, right? So... Uh, I also want to, just in case she's watching, give Mary Antonucci a shout out because she's turning 94. That's pretty awesome, right? Huh? Let's give her a hand. Um, that's, that's awesome. So uh, we have uh, Financial Peace University coming up, and it starts on Tuesday. So if you had heard the announcements over the last month and you're like, oh, that's a good idea. We should do that. I should send this to my friend. They, they might be really interested. Uh, the clock is now in critical. So uh, make sure you hop on and we would love for you to register for Financial Peace University, FPU. Uh, it's an amazing way just to, to learn to plan ahead, to take care of debt, to, to just live free you to live a life of generosity where you can really help those around you, right? And that's, that's uh, really the focus. And so uh, check out FPU. You can register on our website. Uh, and you can also, if you want to follow along with us this morning, you can pull open your Bible app, the Bible app. And if you go to the bottom right-hand corner, there's kind of some, a more button and you look for events click on events, it'll probably be the top event on your list because you are here in the building, and so it uses geolocation to track you. Isn't that encouraging? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's tracking you. So, uh, so you can follow along with where we're going to head today because we are in the end 
of a series that we've called Prepared. The idea of Prepared has been, how do you talk about faith? How do you share faith? How do you, how do you talk to someone that, that maybe isn't sure what they believe, or they're definitely not a Christian, especially when your window of opportunity is really small. Maybe it was just a comment in passing, uh, like, hey, we should all get together. Oh, wait, never mind. You go to church on that day. Or, hey, we should all do X, Y, or Z at work. Oh, wait a minute. Jill can't. She's religious. Or whatever it might happen to be, just kind of these comments in passing. Maybe you have a family member that just has a lot of angst around it. They had a really bad church experience, and they're just, they're, they're, they're very hands-off. How do we answer these kinds of questions? Because they make us uncomfortable, don't they? In fact, sometimes they make us so uncomfortable that what we do is we find ourselves just avoiding those conversations. We can find ourselves maybe avoiding those people and over time, we find we're not having those conversations at all because we're just not hanging around people that would ask us anymore. In fact, when, uh, when, uh, when uh, Barna did a study, they discovered that two out of five Christians say they have no non-Christian friends. Melissa, would you have me, hand me the little remote on that chair right there? Just throw it. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Two out of five Christians say they don't have, they have no non-Christian friends. And 56% of Christians report having two or fewer conversations about faith with non-Christians annually, in a year. So why all the avoidance? Well, we avoid it because it makes us uncomfortable. We avoid it because we're not prepared to have an answer. And so we started with this challenge we started with this challenge, and we said, let's follow Peter's advice. Peter, we, we spent the beginning part of the year diving into the book of Mark, which is the words of Peter. Peter, this fisherman turned disciple of Jesus. Peter, who after Jesus raised from the dead, after he had breakfast with a man he saw die, he goes out on the streets of Jerusalem and becomes the first post-Christian evangelist. And he goes out and he preaches and he says, Listen, you need to know Jesus, the one you heard about that was crucified, is alive. Repent, you need to believe me. And so, so we go to his advice, and Peter said this. Peter said, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. And this has kind of been the, the launching pad for the whole three-week series. Peter constantly found himself in need of an answer. He constantly found himself in situations where people had questions of him, where people weren't sure why he would risk his life and not worship the emperor, why he would not bow to other gods that were so common, why his god was, had to exclude all the other gods around. And so he says, make sure that you have a reason not for just anything, not for public Christian stances for or against X, Y, or Z, not for, for anything, for the hope that you have. Have an answer for the hope that you have. So in week one, we asked this question. We said, how do we answer this question? Why have you personally decided to follow Jesus? Have you wrestled with the answer to that question? Why have you personally decided to follow Jesus? Is it just, is it because you grew up with it and it just feels natural? Is it because, uh, because you just, you, you've wrestled with it and you've struggled around with it and you finally come to this conclusion? Why have you decided to follow Jesus? And then in week two, uh, we said, why do we consider the testimonies about Jesus to be reliable? Why do we even consider those testimonies? So last week we talked about 70 AD and the importance of the fall of Jerusalem and how that affects how we view these four gospel accounts and Peter's letters. And we're going to dive into that starting next week. So here's the thing I want you to think about because we, we talked about this. How do we know the Bible is a reliable like, full of reliable documents. What is this that we hold 
that we speak out of. And so we're going to take four weeks starting next week talking about the Bible. We're going to talk about how it was created. We're going to talk about creation. We're going to talk about the Old Testament. We're going to talk about Paul's epistles and kind of where they came from and why they're important. We're going to kind of look at all these facets of the Bible. We're calling it a view of the Bible from 30,000 feet, because obviously four weeks you can't cover everything in the Bible. And so if you have someone that has walked away from faith because of something they've encountered in the Bible, I want you to pick up the phone this week and like be like, hey, come join me at North Hills. I want to talk about what we're going to talk about with you and just pick your brain. I want to hear your thoughts on looking at the Bible a little bit differently than maybe you grew up with. And so that kind of brings us to this week. Today, I want to explore a different question, and that's this. If there is a good God, why is there so much suffering in the world? If there's a good God, why is there so much suffering in the world? How many have heard this question or have thought this question? It's common for all of our experiences because if God is good— he would eliminate the suffering, the logic goes. And if God is all-powerful, he could eliminate the suffering. So is either God, God must either be not good or not able, the logic goes. If there's so much grief, so much sadness, so much suffering, all you got to do is turn on the news, and it'll inundate you pull up social media, and right in between the cat videos, there's tragedy, and then what people are eating, I don't know, for the day. And so I want to kind of jump into this question, but one quick note, and you'll see as we go along what I mean, that's as we talk about the answer to this question, if there's a good God, why is there so much suffering in the world? A quick note, if you are in the midst of a really difficult season, this may not feel very satisfying. Because there are answers to things that aren't emotionally helpful. Are you with me? That sometimes struggling through a difficult time, it's not just about knowing it up here, it's about knowing something here. And that's a little bit of a different journey. It's about working your process of grief and loss, of anger, whatever it is you might be, like, going through this morning. So this is directed towards what's up here, this question, if there is a good God, why is there so much suffering in the world? This is directed at those who, this is their first defense for, oh, you're a Christian, that is ridiculous, how can you be a Christian with so much suffering around us? How can you be a Christian and see the world the way it is and think there's a God? Because you, most of the time this question it's, is asked, it's, it's actually being used to sort of deflect, isn't it? It's really actually being used, they're not like, hey, let's sit down and study this together. <laughs> they're not looking for a book recommendation. They're not, th this is just the way that they want to say, no, nah, that's not for me. And so a good initial question back, if you get this question from someone, a good initial question back is, oh, it, that is a challenging question. Have you read anything on that topic? Like, have you done any study about it? And if they say no, you might just sort of leave it. <laughs> it or you might say, well, you're not the first person in history to point this out. And there's actually a lot that's been written on the topic. If you'd be interested, just let me know. <laughs> we can have a conversation. We can read through some things. Because it's not like we just woke up in the 21st century and thought, whoa, life is tough. So, 
All that to say, I think one of the best responses I've found to this question, if there is a good God, why is there so much suffering in the world? And you have a minute to actually have this conversation. One of the best responses that I have come across is this. You know what? You're, you're totally right. If you could, would you remove everything bad from the world right now? If you could, and hang on, before you answer, before you like jump to your conclusion, before you say, oh yeah, absolutely, before you jump to the, let me ask you a, a follow-up question. Have you ever done anything bad? And like saying sin is probably not a term that they're going to want to jump towards or understand at all, but have you ever done anything bad? And, and then say, well, did your parents ever do anything bad? Is there, ha, have you ever hurt someone else intentionally, unintentionally? How about your kids? Have they ever done something bad? And what we do from this question, when we ask, hey, if you could just remove everything bad from the world right now, would you? What we find out is that the only way for God to remove all the pain is to remove all those who cause it. The only way for God to remove all the pain is to remove everything that causes it. And that's you and me. <laughs> that's everybody. Everybody. And so at this point, at this point, quite likely, the conversation goes, well, maybe not all the pain, maybe like just the big stuff, or maybe we can kind of quantify pain, according to me, and maybe we can kind of like categorize it in, in some way. But the fact is, is this causes us to pause, doesn't it? Well, yeah, I, I, want God, I want God to remove everything. I want God to just take it all out. But, oh wait, maybe not. I don't want my kids taken out. I don't want my if my parents were taken out, I wouldn't be here. I know what I've done. And so it brings us to this spot. And, it, and, and if we pause, if you and I take a second and we pause, if the person you're talking with pauses, maybe God has a reason to pause as well. Maybe God has a reason to, to kind of stop and think about it. Peter actually, in his second letter, wrote something similar. Peter said this about it. He said, the Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he's what? Patient. He pauses. He waits. He's patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. You, me, every person in history, we understand as Christians, we understand that every human being is made in the image of God. All of us. And that God looks at us and says, hang on, if I wait a little longer, if I wait just a little longer, maybe someone else will come back. Maybe someone else will figure out that I want a relationship with them. Sometimes against all odds, sometimes it quickly becomes evident that it's not God's patience that we're worried about. It's that his patience is a whole lot different from my patience, right? It's that God's a lot more patient with it and a lot more loving towards it and a lot more willing to wait for all people to come to repentance than I am. 
We have hope because God hopes for us. You know, at our house in Denver, we had a problem. Every summer, well, we had lots of problems with the house, but somebody else bought it. It's not my trouble anymore. You know what I'm saying? So, uh, <laughs> one of the problems we had every summer were yellow jackets would sneak in and under the eaves and in the cracks, which we had a few, would just kind of sneak their little nests in. And before you know it, there were yellow jackets flying all around. My kids were quite young at the time, and I thought, this, is, this can't happen. Like, I don't, I don't know what would happen if one of these yellow jackets stung one of my children. I don't want to find out. Let's, let's, let's deal with this. These are pests, right? And one of the things I discovered became one of my favorite things to use. Have you ever used a can of yellow jacket spray? It shoots like 30 feet, you guys. It's amazing. It's this incredible jet stream. Like, I could hit the back vents. If there was a yellow jacket spray, I could stand over here and be like, die, yellow jackets. And I could just hose them down. And so we'd go around every once in a while, every couple months, I'd just go around one afternoon, just be like, okay, I'm going to find those yellow jacket nests. And I'd look for them flying around and be like, there it is. And I just spray it. And it's amazing how quickly they just start, start dropping. And then as they'd come back to the nest, they'd taste whatever's in that stuff, and they'd start dropping. And it took it out. It'd take out a whole nest. Quick, easy. I could stand a long ways off. I didn't have to risk getting stung myself. I didn't make them super angry. They didn't live long enough to come after me or send their children after me. Right? And that bug spray is really what we mean when we say, can we just do away with evil? Wouldn't it be great to take a big can and be like, ha, psh, now it's just. I just brought the justice to that. Right? And we want to just like at a distance so that it doesn't affect us or ours, spray something out into the world that just fixes it, that just eliminates whoever did that evil, wherever that evil is. And if we're really honest about it, if I'm honest about it, the way I want that can in my hand, not in someone else's hand. I want that can in my hand because someone else might see something bad that I do and decide that I should be hosed down. In fact, it's maybe even a little bit more terrifying to say, oh man, I don't know that I got it. I, I'm not sure I'm quite ready to give that can of bug spray, of bad spray, of justice spray to God. Because what if he turns it and notices me? Our own faults might get noticed. Someone close to us might be eliminated And we see it again also in the way we, like, when challenges come up, don't we? Like, we'll hear from someone that they're dealing with something. And, it, and man, our response is, you know what? That is so tough. I am so sorry. Let me give you a hug. I'm going to pray for you. And we mean it, and that prayer matters, and we are empathetic. But that interaction, me knowing that someone else is going through chal something challenging, that doesn't challenge my faith. That doesn't make me doubt whether there's a God. That doesn't make me wonder. 
It's not until something challenging, something difficult, something bad, something, some suffering comes in and intrudes in my life that I start wondering, oh man, if there was a God, he wouldn't let this happen to me. Isn't it? Like there's this hypocrisy in the way that we view things, and it's natural to all of us. It's inconsistent. So we all have this inclination. But in your conversation, as you say, well, you know, would you really eliminate everything? Are you sure you'd want God to eliminate all the bad? Because that would mean you, me, your kids, everything, right? Are, are, are you really sure? And really, another quick opportunity here is simply that you know what's amazing? You know what amazes me about these conversations? Is the fact that you have noticed something that's bad in the world. And you and I, we instinctively know that that is evil. That that should not happen. Yeah, there are some gray areas. There are some areas where we just want to spray. There are some opinions. There are some, there are some argument. There are people on one political side that would love that can for the other political side. <laughs> right? We would love that can, right? right? As tensions build around us, people would love to hose people down, to shut people out, to cancel them. But the fact is, there are things we still all agree on are wrong. We instinctively know that some things should not take place in the world, do we not? We see starvation. We see abuse, death. Reasonable people, regardless of their spiritual beliefs, know some right and wrong. And so the question is, well, did you just make that up in your head? You just decide, this is going to be right for me, and this is going to be wrong for me, and that's my truth. Why is it that so much of the way we look at that agrees with one another? Why do these things find common ground so often? Maybe if you're struggling with your faith this morning, know this, that the fact that you know a right and wrong means that you have part of the image of God in you. If you're struggling with your faith this morning, the simple fact that you know some things should not be is evidence of a divine conscience. Because true humanism, you want to go true humanism, the only thing you should ever do is whatever is personally advantageous to you. Anything outside of that sphere if, would be a waste of time and a waste of your one life to live. In fact, this tension is actually the thing that, you, that led C.S. Lewis, the author C.S. Lewis, to faith. And I, I love Lewis, and, and this, this comes out of Mere Christianity, one of, the, one of the great books, in my opinion, written in the past 200 years. And in Mere Christianity, C.S. Lewis puts it this way. He says, My argument against God was that the universe seems so cruel and unjust. Right? But how had I got to this idea of just and unjust? A man does not call a line crooked unless he has some idea of a straight line. Of course, I could have given up my idea of justice by saying it was nothing but a private idea of my own. But if I did that, then my argument against God collapsed too. If there's no such thing as right and wrong, then I'm not even asking a relevant question about whether or not there can be a God with so much suffering in the world. And this initial question is what made C.S. Lewis decide that there must be a divine presence in the universe. He hadn't gotten to Jesus yet, hadn't gotten to, to the cross. He would get there eventually through other means, but it's this right here that initially led him to the fact 
to decide that there is no other way for me to explain other than the fact that there must be a God because I know some things to be right and some things to be wrong in the world. We also know that the world is wrong, don't we? We know that the world is broken, that there are natural disasters, earthquakes, fires, because we live in California, right? That that, that there are tornadoes and hurricanes in other places of the world, that there are things that happen in the world. And on top of that, there are things that have happened in previous generations that affect us. How many of us deal with having to avoid a certain addiction because you know it's kind of, you're predisposed to it? How many of you, like, I, like, skin cancer gets to be mine because my mom is predisposed to skin cancer. So guess what? So am I. Yay, it's fun. Right? So why? Why does that happen? Because the world is broken. All the way down to our genetics. We're broken. And you see, as Christians... As Christians, we believe that this world is just a beginning. That it's not finished. That it is broken, that sin broke it, but that something better is coming. That a world where we may know about sin, but we choose not to sin is on the way. Paul put it this way, as Paul talked about the the pain and suffering in the world and that he sees it all around in his famous chapter in Romans 8. He says, I consider that our present sufferings aren't even worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us, that something is coming, that hope is on the way. Something is coming. He says, for the creation waits. The world, the universe waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it. And in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay. Have we seen decay? See decay when you look around the world from to decay and brought into the freedom and the glory of the children of God. From the beginning, you see, Christians haven't looked at suffering and said, well, yeah, there's a lot of suffering in the world. Hadn't noticed that before. Uh, Maybe there can't be a God. No, from the beginning, Christians have looked at the suffering in the world and said, yes, that's part of our story. Because we follow a person who we believe was God himself that suffered on a cross and died for us. Suffering is part of the tradition that I follow. Suffering, challenge, difficulty, it's part of our story. All of creation knows that this isn't the way things are supposed to be. We suffer because of the actions of others. That's not fair. We hurt one another without intending to. We assume things about one another left and right. Things are not as they are intended to be. But something universe-altering took place. God looked down into the mess Look down into the brokenness. Look down into the suffering and said, I'm going there to be with them. To be with you and me. So God entered into our pain and our suffering so that he could be patient and so that he could forgive and so that he could bear as long as possible in hopes that just maybe one more 
could come to God. You see, God would rather forgive you than remove you. And we look around today and we say, well, things are pretty sketchy. Jesus could be coming in my lifetime. Why is he not here yet? I'll tell you why. Because he's patient. And if just one more, if just one more person could come around and say, you know what? I want to trust God with my life. If just one more, then God would wait as long as he needed to. That's a lot more patience than I have. But it's a patience that I can strive for. It's a care for others that I can try and attain. See, there's no emotionally satisfying reason for the problem of pain. Because when you're in pain, it is just terrible. It's suffering. But we have knowledge of good and evil. And we know that we can resist evil because we have the image of God inside us. We know that Jesus pointed to a day when all things would be set right. And he kept talking about it constantly. And so we have hope and we have faith that someday this world will be set right. Someday we won't have the struggles we have today. That someday that world will be here where there is no sin because we're just choosing not to. And things have been restored beneath the cellular level. I don't even know how that works. In ways that only God can do. So here's my challenge for you this week. We need to talk about this question. Have you ever been asked, is, if there is a good God, why is there so much suffering? I know most of you have. Everybody, like, for the most part, raised their hands. How did you respond? How do you respond? You see, you can't answer this question until you have an answer for this question. Are you with me? You can rattle off a quote. You can say, hang on, let me grab my mere Christianity. I'll talk to you about it. But until you struggle with this and come to your own answer, you won't have an answer. You won't be prepared to answer it. And so here's what I want you to do for your walk. I want you to formulate an answer for yourself to this question. If you were to write it out, you've got a lot of homework in this series. I don't know how you're catching up. I don't know where you're at in your homework. Week one, we said, have you wrestled with, have you written down your short answer to why it is that you follow Jesus? Week two, we said, have you figured out and wrestled with your 15-minute answer to why you trust the Gospels to tell the story of Jesus that you believe? And then, now we have this one sit down and wrestle with and write out and put notes together, whatever you need to do to be prepared to answer this question. Because the fact is, is, yeah, there's a lot of pain and suffering in the world and God's a lot more patient with it than I wish he was, if I'm honest. But he was patient with me. He was patient with me. Would you bow your heads with me? God, thank you that you are the author. You give us our faith and you will complete it. God, we just pray. I pray that you would be with us as we struggle with this, as we have these conversations. God, I pray that this week that one of these faith conversations would be on its way to each of us. I pray that, that we would be prepared for a conversation about faith. And that we could maybe invite them to next week or that, that we could have an answer about suffering or about following Jesus. God, may we be prepared. And may we just have an incredible 
understanding and peace with what you do for us. We pray this in your name. Amen.